there I am. I'm here. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. I see we have around 60 attendees today and we I'm sure more will join. And we are so excited to have this um, panel. This is a, a series of an, uh, panels to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Master of Medical Sciences in Global Health Delivery. So this program was established in 2012 uh, through the work of many faculty in the Harvard Medical School Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. And uh, among them, uh, Paul Farmer, who uh, who was a, you know, an amazing leader in global health and sadly passed away in February, but also many other faculty in our department, including a true champion of global health, um, Joya Mukherjee, who is our program director and who's joining us today. Since 2012, um, our program has welcomed over 100 students into the program. We have um, many, many alumni and four alumni are here joining us today. I just will also point out, we are currently accepting applications for our next class. And I have on the slide, one of these slides, um, our website for more information on that. Uh, I will also chat to people that website so that you have that. And uh, just a reminder, we will be having a series of these 10th anniversary panels. So I will chat information on how you can learn more about those others. So um, without further ado, I will quickly go through uh, what today's panel is about, and then I'll welcome Joya to, to, to speak. Um, we have three panelists today. Uh, we will have Byler Barry speak. Bailer Barry, or Mohammed Bailer Barry, is a physician from Sierra Leone. Uh, he's also currently a PhD candidate, and he graduated from our program in 2016. He is the executive director of Partners in Health in Sierra Leone. We will also have Molino um, and Diaz and Daisy, sorry, Molino, Molino and Daisy Gie. Steve Molino is a, um, a physician for, originally from Burundi, now working in Lesotho with Partners in Health. And he is the executive director of Partners in Health Lesotho and graduated from our program in 2014. And then we'll have Hannah Sane, who is um, graduated from our program in 2018. And she's a very experienced um, manager of global health programs, currently the executive director of the Community Outreach and Patient Empowerment Program, which is also called COPE in Navajo Nation. So now what I'm gonna do is stop the share here and I'll just introduce Joya Mukherjee, who is um, a physician with and global health advocate with years and years of experience. Uh, she is a, um, a professor here at Harvard Medical School, again, our program director and also the chief medical officer for Partners in Health. So Joya, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Um, thank you so much, Christina, and thank you for so many people to tune in for the 10th anniversary kickoff. Um, we are gonna hear from many of our alumni uh, over the next several months. And uh, Christina's already introduced those who are speaking today, but I will say that the Masters in Global Health Delivery is a two-year program um, that is the, its home is the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. And the reason for that is Paul. Uh, Paul's model of leadership and scholarship was distinctly rooted in social medicine, in really understanding the roots of disease, trying to mitigate them, and really always being proximate to those who were suffering the most. And you know, we don't feel that global health can be done without the integration of social medicine, of the ideas of social medicine, of the use of tools uh, from looking at a historic analysis to the use of ethnography, uh, qualitative methods, the many uh, sort of uh, non uh, data only. Now, we also uh, do look at uh, epidemiology and statistics and all of our graduate students have really done a variety of different methods, but always centering proximity to the patients. And so we have been just thrilled over the last 10 years that so many of our graduates have risen to leadership positions in, um, in global health, at partners in health, but also in organizations and ministries around the world. So we're starting with these uh, three of our amazing graduates. Um, 
but very excited to, you said four, Christina, are there four? Did I say four? I'm sorry. Okay. No, I thought <laughs> maybe you're three. talking about me. I'm practically <laughs> a graduate of the program. I'm not, uh, but, but I feel like I am. Um, and, and so it's just been an amazing um, thing to see these people, most of our uh, uh, students come in as already having at least five years of experience. And because of that, uh, they, they, they come with problems that they want to solve and tackle and address. And so um, we've, we've just been so fortunate to, um, to have these amazing students that go on to be amazing leadership leaders. So our first panel is really to talk about leadership in global health. Um, and so I believe we're starting with, um, with uh, Molino, Dr. Molino and Daisy uh, who has uh, been now the executive, executive director of PIH in Lesotho, um, had worked there as chief medical officer um, and uh, is one of the first graduates uh, in the first cohort of just four students uh, from 2014. So I'd love to turn it over to Molino, to uh, Dr. Indezigie, uh, to talk about his experience in leadership uh, in global health. He leads a program in Lesotho that serves almost half of the country of Lesotho, uh, a country that has the highest HIV and TB burdens in the world. Um, it's extremely mountainous, hard to reach areas are common. And so Molina will be sharing uh, his experiences with us. Go ahead, Dr. Molina. Thank you so much, uh, Joya. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining uh, this uh, panel discussion. I'm going to share my screen. Um, my name is Merino Daizigie, and I'm from the first cohort of uh, MMSC program. Um, I graduated in 2014. Um, I'm going to share my story uh, about you know, leadership in global health. Um, global health delivery is not, is not an easy job. Uh, we really tackle um, complex, um, you know, uh, issues, including communicable and non-communicable diseases, um, disasters, uh, management, epidemic and pandemics, uh, malnutrition, uh, issues of water and sanitation. Um, leadership in this field uh, requires a passion to solve complex problems and work with uh, humility. Working with local communities and um, public community, uh, public sector leaders to provide care and address community needs is a key for success uh, in leadership. Um, leadership in global health really means challenging the status quo. The world is in a critical need of uh, health systems that can deliver equitable um, outcomes. We have an obligation to challenge the status quo and save lives of the most uh, vulnerable. Um, as a global health leader, um, you know, we must be willing to understand uh, social forces that result in unequal health outcomes and fight for uh, social justice. Um, we must really work um, you know, with social medicine principles, as Joya said, um, to be, you know, um, proximity uh, to the vulnerable, analyzing social forces that impact patients and developing policies um, and, you know, you know that help um, the most vulnerable and provide equitable uh, outcomes. We must develop and implement policies and strategies and systems uh, from human resources to legal guidelines to financial management to help the organization operate on safe side and also fairly. And you know, we also need to we have to raise funds to consistently improve uh, quality of care um, and overall operations. And we must cultivate and maintain 
uh, relationship with the government and other non-government partners and build a network of really strong uh, social justice fighters. Um, well, when you talk about um, the leadership, we must uh, think about building a culture of teamwork and build a team of winners. And, um, you know, despite all challenging situations, we must build a team of winners. We must set up um, platforms to discuss issues that hinder progress towards achieving our goals um, and, found, and find a solution, uh, find solutions together. Um, so this is um, my team uh, during a retreat last year, um, where we have to really make everyone understand that we are winners together, despite all our challenges, despite going through the pandemic, we must all work together to be, um, you know, um, to solve complex problems. And, you know, as a global health uh, leader, uh, we, you know, we confront challenging situations and we also have to respond um, to crisis. And I'm going to give you an example of, you know, um, uh, COVID-19, lack of oxygen in COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, COVID-19 has shown us gaps in oxygen worldwide. And prior to um, the pandemic, Lesotho had no oxygen plant. We had been importing oxygen from uh, South Africa. And there was time where we really need, um, you know, oxygen, there was a crisis. Um, we build the first oxygen plant to supply oxygen to our MDRTB hospital, to our isolation uh, for drug resistant TB co-infected with COVID-19, and uh, uh, to supply oxygen to the National Treatment Center and also to our facilities. And when the second wave of COVID-19 has hit Lesotho, the demand of oxygen has increased a lot and we have been receiving um, you know, calls from different hospitals and uh, health centers to, you know, to supply oxygen. We decided to operate the plant um, seven days a week, day and night, to try to maximize uh, the oxygen production. But uh, we realized that um, establishing a PSA plant is not enough. We have to make sure that uh, we keep producing high purity oxygen and uh, we ensure a fair distribution to different facilities. And we then um, started to accompany the Minister of Health to strengthen all the overall oxygen uh, ecosystem in the country, including hiring biomedical engineers, trained clinicians on oxygen therapy, and technicians on maintenance and repair of oxygen concentrators. It has been a journey. So basically in global health, when you try to solve a problem, uh, a problem you have to think about holistic approach of you know, solving that problem and make sure that the social forces that affect um, you know, patient care are also um, you know, taken uh, into consideration. And um, we have been also uh, trying to really uh, help the, the government of uh, Lesotho to deal with um, uh, another crisis, um, which is TB. Uh, Lesotho has the highest TB incidence in the world, and there is a huge gap in diagnostics. Um, and to respond to this crisis, we have to really um, challenge the status quo. Uh, we have to come up with innovative interventions to make sure that, you know, uh, we bring in medical technologies. Um, and of course, we have to work with uh, the Ministry of Health leadership, uh, the other institutions like WHO to make sure that the technologies that we are bringing, we are bringing in is like uh, an example of what is possible in uh, in uh, uh, for the most um, vulnerable and uh, underserved communities. We have established uh, molecular testing for TB in rural um, health centers, and we 
we had installed uh, digital X-ray machines and piloted the use of computer-aided TB detection software, which is artificial intelligence, as well as teleradiology systems, and um, really had the second opinion uh, from uh, for the front the frontline clinicians. We have raised money through Global Fund and the Japan government, and we presented the evidence to the government to change the policy um, and you know scale up this um, innov these innovations. This is how the the, the system uh, look looks like. Uh, basically, these are portable digital X-ray machines. Uh, they are uh, they are able to take as many uh, images as possible, and the images are uploaded into the cloud database, and they are first. The images are first uh, read by the computer-aided TB detection software, uh, which you know gives uh, which gives you know uh, feedback. Um, but we don't only rely on the feedback from the the, the software. There is a possibility of um, giving real-time feedback, uh, second opinion from senior clinicians. And as we are speaking, um, you know, Joya and other network of uh, senior TB clinicians and radiologists from uh, PIH are able to log in and support frontline clinicians to manage complex um, cases. Okay, and Malina, we have Malina, also- Just a note, sorry, Melina, I just to finish up as we wanna uh, keep, Keep everything moving. So thanks. Go yeah, ahead. thank you. Yeah, we're getting there. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just... Yeah, we also have challenges. Uh, we don't have enough funding to really address um, critical needs for the vulnerable uh, populations. There is high turnover in the senior leadership the, of the Minister of Health, which is affecting the implementation of health strategies and health service delivery. And of course, in global health world, there is a corruption that we have to face. And um, also there are vertical funding, uh, vertical funding for, from some donors, which uh, makes other uh, programs uh, suffer. Uh -oh. I think, I think Polina might've frozen. Um, I will give them a, a few seconds here. Hello. Oh, yeah, yes, ahead. you're back. Go ahead, Melina. You, you dropped out for a second. Just you can finish your conclusions from the beginning. Oh, you're frozen again. You could turn off your video if you'd like, Melina. That might, I don't know if that would help. Yeah. Okay, I'll just uh, I'll just finish. Yeah, formally. good leadership um, okay. in the global health setting. And hello, go ahead. C can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, I was saying that good leadership requires a lot of efforts to change the status quo and convince the world that it is possible to save lives for the most vulnerable and underserved communities across the globe. And global health is a movement for social justice. And Dr. Paul Farmer has taught us how to change the world. As we celebrate this 10th uh, anniversary of the MMC program, we will cherish Dr. Paul Farmer's uh, life and legacy. And we have an obligation of keeping the fire burning. I thank you very much, and um, I'm happy to respond to any question. Thank you. Thank you. Let's um, thank, just thank you, Melina. Christina. Sorry, just to jump in. Um, just uh, the format, which I forgot to mention before. We're going to have three speakers, and then we'll have time for discussion. So I see questions. Thank you for your question on the Q and A. Yeah. But okay. let's go I ahead think, and yeah, yeah. I think that's my role, Christina. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Go ahead. So uh, we'd like to invite Dr. Muhammad Byler Berry to be our next speaker. And he um, will be sharing his leadership experiences uh, from Sierra Leone. 
Uh, and Dr. Barry is a Sierra Leonean uh, national who went to medical school during the period of wartime in Sierra Leone, uh, made the decision to stay in his country and build uh, an organization to help the really the most vulnerable in an area that the war was heavily fought in Kono district. Um, he came actually to Harvard to study tuberculosis um, in this region of, of Kono, uh, but Ebola happened. And so Byler was really thrust into the national and international limelight as one of the top Ebola fighters uh, and leveraged uh, all resources at his um, disposal, including inviting uh, Partners in Health into Sierra Leone. Uh, and we're very happy he did. Uh, and now he runs the Well Body, which was the organization he founded, uh, a PIH, um, you know, strong work uh, in Kono District. So, uh, and he's also completing a PhD soon at the University of San Francisco. So uh, go ahead, Byler. Thank you, Joya. So um, it's difficult to talk after Melino, and I think even doing my uh, master's program, um, I was the co-author after Melino, and we learned a lot from him. But I would use uh, I will use one of our pro one of our successful projects to discuss um, leadership in global health. Let me try to share my screen. Can you see my screen? We can, but it's very small. Can you? Oh, there, there now we, we see now it. Now we can yep. see it. Now we can see it. So I will use the uh, mental health program um, <clears throat> that we worked on and transformed the Sierra Leone Psychiatric Teaching Hospital um, in five, six years to describe what the global um, leadership means and also using the social theories. And we know. Um, Mental health is a socially constructed disease that also informs many ways that is used to handle the to tackle the disease as a mentally as a as a socially constructed disease. But I would also like for, for us to talk about a little history of the Sierra Leone and the mental health uh, and the mental health program in Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone is a country, a small country in West Africa, and um, for eight million people. And 8 million people with only two psychiatrists and one dedicated mental health hospital. And this mental health hospital was established in 1820s, the first um, mental health hospital in West Africa. And it was the asylum for the free slaves and um, other people within the African region that have uh, mental problems to be kept with no medications, no, 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 no lab, nothing like to see as a hospital. And it's remained that way for decades and, cent and centuries. And then um, the war came again and destroyed the hospital. So the condition became very dear. There were the shelves were empty of medications and nothing in terms of a hospital, no clinicians. And no clinician would love to work there. And like also we'll try to encourage people to do psychiatry and nobody's want to do psychiatry because of the horrible conditions under which um, the hospital is and the mental health situation is. And so this is just an example of showing how it was built in 1820 and this is how the hospital was before we started working there. It was like a, a place for to abandon, to abandon patients, abandon people and like, um, nothing in terms of um, treatment and nothing in terms of diagnosis and nothing in terms of um, um, health care. And that resulted in um, 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 health care professionals to chain patients because like when somebody is psychotic is not on medications and whatever it is to seek to, 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 put, to protect their lives and, and the lives of others, they had to be chained in the, in the, in the beds and, and, and and living in very bad um, um, condition. So when we when we approached this hospital to want to work there, actually we went there to visit the hospital and with one of our one of our board members and and our founders, um, um, Ophelia, and we saw how deplorable the condition is or whatever. And we wanted to support. 
But like, as you know, PIH and PIH, we work directly with government. And so I was asked, <clears throat> I was asked then because I was just a strategic advisor to the executive director. I was asked to lead that project to see how we can start working in the hospital. So what we did first, we engaged the, 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 the leadership at the hospital level. We had a discussion, we talked about what to do and what, what, what we can do to help the hospital and whatever. And we had his buy-in and his staff's buy-in. Then he led us to the Ministry of Health and um, we went to the ministry, we tell them that we wanna, work, wanna support the hospital and we wanna work with them to help the hospital. So we agreed and then we, we, we went to the hospital and implemented our 5S, our 5S model, which is like staff, um, space, staff, um, systems and social support. So we, when, because we believe that um, only when you implement all the strategies together in a facility, then you will see drastic change. And this is a typical example of how uh, we created a drastic change at, at Kisi. Because when we went, we, okay, the hospital is actually normally known as Kisi because it's in the community called Kisi in Sierra Leone. So we put the, the, the five S's, which is space, we renovated, um, we renovated the whole hospital, we built a, a, a laboratory for the, for, for the hospital and then built a pharmacy and, and renovated the hospital to become a very good hospital that you can wanna put your patients. And they will build systems, effective systems where patients are, 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 are registered and entered and have their contacts to follow up and all those stuff. And then we, we put staff, we hired some few staff to add. We hired a psychiatrist and a psychologist to add to the hospital and, and encourage staff and nurses and work with the government to post staff and, 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 and start to build equipment. And one of the most important thing is like, Sierra Leone didn't consider mental health as part of their essential package of, of um, a basic package of, of health services within Sierra Leone. So therefore they do not budget for mental health. They do not budget for, for anything for mental health. So we started also engaging the government and now I would love to announce that now they have it in their essential package and now they're considering mental health as a condition, as a condition that can be cured and treated. So we build systems and also we put stuff, we brought medications at the hospital that were not there. We brought, um, equip, uh, we brought um, um, lab equipment and, 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 and we brought supplies and everything for the lab and, and, and then we started seeing improvement. Then we added social support for patients that are discharged and need to come back to hospital or patients that require that we're just abandoned in Freetown, that don't have a place to live. When they recover at the hospital, we find um, um, a place for them to live. We provide food support at the hospital and social support within the, 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 the hospital. And in three years, we started working there in 2018. In three years, this is the hospital now, like this is the ward with all the nice beds and we, we have the the, 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 the the whole hospital painted and renovated, and then it was opened by the president of the country in 2020. In 2020 and they have this plaque that said we started supporting KCR 20. But all of this is what we did, but anyway, I wanna just give a story of one particular patient because then we started as a, a pediatric psychiatric program in Katkisi that was not in the country. And um, um, we built this, this, com this component in the hospital and made it very nice. And then one patient who is 13 year old had an ep epilepsy. And epilepsy also is a socially constructed disease and it's mostly classed as you're being struck by a demon or, or like you, 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 you have a mental health program or whatever. So they're basically blending mental health and epilepsy into the same category. And this child, is 13 years old and she's been pulled from school because of her epilepsy. She's having um, seizures, like three to four seizures a, 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 a month. And like, so the parents withdraw her and confine her at home. And, but then when we opened, when we renovated this hospital, everybody started talking about the hospital. So the sister of this kid brought the kid to, to the hospital. And um, 
she started treatment and now for the first time she reported zero 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 seizures now for three months and now she's considering going back to school and she this is like on her first revisit in the hospital she was smiling this time when before she was like um not talking to anyone distracted and very depressed and now she's coming over and so this is like some of the good results of some of the good results of the impact and like this is also the general impact of the hospital when we started from 2018 to 2021 we admitted um we admitted 1265 patients and patients attended occupational therapy 564 or more impacts in inpatient discharge and um, we have more outpatient visits now than inpatients before because they just used to take patients to the hospital to, to just abandon them, family abandon them. But now they will go there because they're scared. They have all the, all the five S's that, we, that is required for healthcare in, in the hospital. And so people are now happy. They're coming with their patients and we're seeing a lot more improvement. And also like two months or three months ago, we have the, the, the um, West African College of, of, of Psychiatry came to Sierra Leone so that they can see how they can um, accredit the Sierra Leone Mental Hospital as a, as a, as a postgraduate study. We are so excited about that. And um, also because of this improvement, now we have eight, eight students already enrolled in the program to do postgraduate study to become psychiatry and psychiatrists. And like four of them have already passed their primary exams. Um, which is like the part one exams with the Cielium, uh, with the West African College. And now they're going into the, they're taking their parts two very soon and then they become psychiatrists. So it just shows how a problem is existing. And if you don't take the bold step to, to go in front of the problem and solve it before nobody's interested to do psychiatry. Now we have about eight or many more are, are interested in. In, in becoming psychiatrists in the hospital because of the changes they see in the hospital. They see the improvement in the hospital and now they are confident. They know that if they learn in that facility, they will learn well. And we also have this partnership with Harvard University through BEPI doing the, the, the didactic training online and then do the clinical training by the psychiatrist we hired at Kisi and the one Sierra Leone psychiatrist that is there um, they're doing the direct and then they're doing the clinical, the, clean, the bedside uh, teaching and they discuss with BEPI and others when they have difficult cases. So this is like just an example of how uh, mental health leadership, sorry, um, global health leadership is like you look at a problem, you, you try to identify how can you solve this problem using the social theories and using some of the, 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 the ideas that you know and like unintended consequences, looking at unintended consequences first before designing your programs and everything and get, so this is just a statement um, uh, made by this medical superintendent in the hospital and the only psychiatrist working in the government, in government facilities in, in the government, in the public sector in Sierra Leone. Dr. Jalo said people in Sierra Leone are now starting to open up about mental health and now they are coming. Mostly we're seeing a lot of outpatients now. And um, so in mental health, in, 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 in global health, we, we tackle um, difficult problems and we use um, special solutions to solve special problems. And as I want to see what Joya will say, say yes. Anywhere say we yes. <laughs> say yes. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Byler. Uh, and I have to credit our brother Maxo with the say yes line and coming from Paul's house of yes. Um, we're going to have lots of time for questions and discussion. Uh, feel free to keep writing the questions in the chat. Um, and also we will um, be taking live questions as well. Um, and our last panelist uh, is Hannah Sen, who is the director, executive director of the COPE uh, project, which is also part of Partners in Health based in the Navajo Nation. And uh, Hannah did her research on barriers to cancer care among Navajo people and was very, very 
close uh, proximity to both patients and community health representatives. And a lot of the work she, she does as executive director uh, at COPE is, is very close to these community health representatives and the network of people who are you know, in Navajo they, themselves, patients and people also you know, struggling with extreme poverty. And uh, just to mention that Hannah took this role in the middle of the COVID crisis. So uh, Hannah, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Joya. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. So I'm really excited to have this opportunity to get to share a little bit of what we've learned as a team over the years, and also to be on a panel with just my esteemed colleagues. I think it's always very exciting to have the opportunity to learn from each other and to share the different perspectives that we have through experience. So as Joya mentioned, I've been really fortunate to be part of the COPE team over the past 12 years or so. And just to share a little bit about the background of COPE, COPE is an organization that started as a collaboration with um, Partners in Health, Navajo Nation, Indian Health Service, and Brigham and Women's Hospital. And in that partnership, our vision is to eliminate health disparities and improve the well being of American Indians and Alaska Natives. And particularly, in order to achieve this, we really feel that it's important to leverage the knowledge and wisdom within the community because we believe that really it's from that knowledge and wisdom that we'll be able to address and overturn long standing historic health inequities. And what I wanted to share a little bit today, because we don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to share a few ways that we try to incorporate or put into practice some of those theories that um, Byler was mentioning and how we really try to move that forward, reflecting this vision and mission. So as was mentioned, Navajo Nation is a sovereign nation. It's roughly the size of Vermont, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire combined, and it's in the southwest area of the United States. And one of the things that's been really important in terms of the leadership for myself, but also our organization overall, has been the value of mentorship from lived experience. And so when we're trying to understand, you know, how do we address some of the challenges that are manifested in terms of a chronic health condition or working through some of the challenges that include cancer or other illnesses, it's really important for us to think about how we can actually leverage the knowledge within the community. So one of the ways that has been really pivotal for us has been to learn from and be mentored by patients, family members, community health workers that are called CHRs here. And a few of the examples that I wanted to share are Patient and Family Advisory Council for our cancer program. The picture on the left is actually a picture from last year when the Patient and Family Advisory Council wanted to work on how to really address some of the challenges related to COVID and access to cancer care and had designed uh, messaging in Navajo and English to share out with the community on the radio, to share out um, through social media and the newspaper. And what we've really learned in the process of being guided by a patient and family advisory council, as well as CHRs, which is the picture on the right, is that they really know all of the different elements that are at play in trying to provide the best possible care and to address some of the challenges that someone might be experiencing in the home. And so within our role, we really want to make sure that we're affording those opportunities to be mentored by those that have that lived experience, particularly when we're designing programs 
or whenever we're trying to also understand what are the outcomes that are most important to the community? How can we bring those together? To share a little bit about how this connects to the solutions to address some of these larger challenges. I wanted to talk a little bit about access to healthy foods. So when we had started working closely with CHRs, community health representatives, they're a program that has been established on Navajo Nation since 1968, so very longstanding. But they had shared some of the areas that they thought would be really important to provide support in the community and also to support them. And as we were working to support individuals with uncontrolled chronic conditions, they had mentioned that in working closely with those individuals, the challenge that arose was access to healthy foods. So if someone wanted to make a healthy choice, the challenge they had was how are they actually going to be able to do that if they had to drive hours to get to the closest store that had you know, options for fresh fruits and vegetables or even the healthy traditional foods. And to understand how we could address that, we took the time to learn from the community to get their feedback. So not only from CHRs and community members, but also leaders on what were some of the ideas they had to address this challenge in an area that's very rural and very large. And one of the areas that they had suggested was to work with some of the smaller stores that are in the community and try to support those stores in being able to provide healthy options. They also talked about the importance of bringing in other partners, so small store owners, growers, really integrating that with individuals that are working in the clinic and learning from young families particularly because they're starting those early healthy habits. And so out of that feedback is how we were able to strengthen some of these programs. And particularly, we work with the small stores to help to support them with training materials, but also the physical refrigeration or display that they need to be able to provide more healthy options in those rural areas. And then we also work with the uh, clinical teams to be able to support individuals with a fresh fruits and vegetables prescription, and then collaborate as well with the growers to think about how can we actually strengthen the local food system and integrate all those partners. So it includes partners that are not necessarily always working together. They're in different sectors, but that's been really important to have a broader holistic approach and to really implement those solutions that come from the community. And finally, I'll just mention that in the work that we've been able to collaborate in over the past decade or so, one of the things we found to be very, very important is learning from those that are in the community, those that are in the homes. And so these are a few pictures of some of the CHRs that work really closely with their patients and have that trust, are able to align care to be tailored to the culture and in the Navajo language. And it has been really important to learn from them in order to be able to have the impact on, of course, the health outcomes. And that leverages some of the challenges that someone might have in their home. Maybe they have uncontrolled uh, diabetes, but if their roof is leaking, that might be the concern that needs to be addressed before they're able to really focus on their health. And so it's been really important to work closely with CHRs and learn from the work that they do in the home and then develop programs that fill those gaps and really provide that broad care that leverages the partners and the systems here on Navajo Nation. So I'll stop there and just say a thank you to everyone that's joining today and most importantly to all the partners that we work with that really make this work possible. Great. Thank you so much, Hannah. Uh, that just such beautiful work of accompaniment. 
Um, I just want to take a moment to uh, remember Paul, uh, as this is the very first um, 10th anniversary event that we're having. And, you know, I, I know that Paul was all about accompaniment, proximity to patients, and teaching students. And so, you know, we're missing him as we start this new cohort, this 10th anniversary cohort. Um, but I know he's smiling down at us um, with all the great work of accompaniment. So there are many questions um, in the Q&A. And what I'm gonna do is summarize those um, and reflect them back in terms of the themes of this, um, this seminar. Uh, but also feel free to raise your hand if you want to come off mute and ask a question. I can call on you and I'll see those hands as well. Um, so the first question is really, um, I, I would say can be for all three of you, which is the, how do you work with and coordinate with government and non-governmental partners. Um, and I think that, you know, we know that the synergies that we need to achieve are gonna take many sources of uh, human beings, of money, of other kinds of resources. So uh, Hannah, as you were last, uh, you know, how do you think about your leadership, what you learned in the program and how you think about coordinating across a variety of partners? Thanks, Joya. I think this is a really important question because I think Molino had mentioned this earlier that it takes a lot of patience and a lot of time. I think these relationships that are built are built on trust. And sometimes it can be challenging because there is, you know, a history of maybe programs that have come and left, of programs that maybe were creating a parallel system to the public health sector, and that can be really challenging. So I think when starting to approach it, it's really important to be patient and to also be very transparent and to be collaborative. So sometimes there might be you know, a program that's existing and it's really important to think about how can that program be supported and then how can those partners come together? So on Navajo Nation, there's a number of different public sector partners. So there's Indian Health Service and some of the other tribal health organizations that provide care. And then there are programs that are within Navajo Nation government under the Department of Health or the Department of Education. And a lot of times those different programs are really under-resourced. And so it can be challenging for them to have the opportunity to kind of coordinate with others or bring people together. And so sometimes even just that can be so important to understand what each program is doing and then how can those programs have you know, a shared vision in moving forward. And I think it's really important that that collaboration comes from the community up. A lot of times, you know, there may be different individuals and programs that change over time. You know, even in health facilities, providers can change quickly. And so it's really important that those collaborations are based on partners that are in the community, because that will ensure that they're being sustained over time. It's certainly something that is worth investing in, and it, it really does pay off. It's something that takes time. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, I'll go back to Molino since you mentioned him. What's your take? Because there are questions about your example of the oxygen uh, plant, particularly, and you know how do you work with the government, with other partners, to assure that will be maintained and and distributed, and 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 what do you tap into from your from your history with our department and your program to sort of help you understand or help you do that work, Molino? Yeah, thank you, Joya. Um, well, we, as, as I said, uh, uh, the, 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 the oxygen needs in, term, in, in times of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, there was, you know, it was just a crisis um and we had to you know to try our level best to respond to the crisis and of course uh, different organizations had different approaches uh some of the organizations 
wanted just to place a bulk procurement of, you know, oxygen. Um, others thought of, you know, buying oxygen concentrators, um, which is also great. Others thought of, you know, buying liquid oxygen. So basically, uh, for us, when we think about uh, solving the, uh, you know, the oxygen crisis and supporting the overall oxygen ecosystem, we think about, uh, we think through the framework of five S's, you know, we think about, you know, how can we put uh, or support the government to have a sustainable solution uh, to this crisis. Uh, when we build uh, an oxygen plant, um, it was like the first uh, plant in the country. Then we thought of you know, hiring biomedical engineers, uh, uh, procuring oxygen standards, uh, putting in place um, a distribution uh, system. So, and we have proven that it is possible to produce oxygen locally um, and train people on operating the, the plant. Now we ended up being the main uh, technical advisor to the ministry on how to run the plant, how to operate the plant, how to produce high purity oxygen. And um, we continue to mobilize funding to ensure that you know, we have a transport system in place to distribute oxygen uh, in different fa facilities. So basically, when we think about uh, solving a problem, we think of you know, a holistic approach to ensure that uh, sustainability will be there even after the, the, the pandemic, um, you know, to put in place systems which will support uh, overall um, uh, service delivery in the country. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Molino. Um, you know, Byler, you also uh, mentioned the five S's, uh, staff, dust, face, system, social support. Um, and I think a similar question coming to you about sort of what is the plan of when, you know, people say sustainability, my students know I hate the word, but, um, you know, how do we sustain this work over time, which is different than the traditional idea that it should be handed over to the government and they can pay for everything. But, you know, what is the plan, uh, Byler, for sort of sustaining the, the mental health services and, and scaling it um, uh, so that it's available to people throughout Sierra Leone? You're on mute, Byler. Now you're I think frozen. he might have frozen mute. Yeah. yeah, frozen and on mute. Okay, well, while, while we're uh, waiting uh, for Byler, uh, I think it would be, um, I'll go back to Hannah for a second and then when Byler rejoins. Um, but, you know, there are a couple of questions around, you know, patient-centered care. And I think, you know, COPE is all about that. Uh, but of course, across PIH, we feel that the patient should be the focus of all interventions. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how COPE, but also your leadership style is, you know, how do you stay proximate to the needs of the patients? Back, I don't know that um, I kind of like lost the the internet went off. Yes. So I had to, okay, great, Byler. So yeah, like, go. You know, did you hear the question? I had like about how you know you hit the word sustainability. How can we sustain um, this what project? Is your, how do you think about it? Not even how do you sustain it, but how do you think about both sustaining the work we're doing and also scaling it so that people around the country will get those services. Yeah, so thank you very much. I think um, one I'll answer for how we're gonna spread it, how we're gonna scale it up or whatever. So for Cornwall, which is our main base where we're working, we're already, we already started a community-based um, mental health program that we're running there very well. And um, our plan is to scale up that 
community-based mental health, um, encourage the government to scale it up across the country. But we just also installed uh, a tool-free line for mental health. We just launched it today. In fact, this morning, we have an SMT where we announced to launch the tool free line where people that have mental health conditions and have mental health patients or whatever can call the tool free lines. Because we know even if you see they will call, maybe they don't have a, a, a um, top up or whatever. This is a tool free line they can call to get their access to mental health services within the country. So it's not only for Freetown is where we have the hospital, but in, in the whole country, we're trying to, to develop a, a community-based program and then have met, mental health nurses stationed in each of the districts. So one way we can, like somebody I saw from the chat, somebody's asking, how do you hire the psychiatrist? How do you maintain that? Now we're starting the training program. We've started the training program already. and. Before we had nobody interested in psychiatry, and now we have eight people. Four already passed the primary, uh, primary the first, the primary exams, and now they're going to their secondary exams, which is the last exam for them to become um, psychiatrists. And we have four other studying for the primary right now, and they're doing this um, cross-site. Um, 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 Harvard is providing the didactic training while the psychiatrists in, in country are providing the bedside training. And the thing like we started along with where mental health was not even part of the, the basic health package. But now we've tried through technical working group, through engagement with the ministry. And the, now it's included in the basic package of essential services. And they will start to procure drugs for mental health. So that's a we know like people will say, oh, we'll turn it over to the government. We definitely know that the Sierra Leone government will not be able to, to run the mental health program fully in Sierra Leone. And we are committed to continue raising money, to continue to support them and try to see what they can take over, what they cannot take over to continue. As partners in health, we know we don't go to a country and then leave the country so easily or leave a program so easily, we'll continue to raise funds and continue supporting the program as long as the program is in existence, but also trying to see how we can turn over some of the things that we determine that the government is able to take over. Like for example, the training program, if we do training and have a lot of um, psychiatrists, doctors or whatever, then we can turn it over because then we'll have a lot of professors in the country to teach the program or whatever. But in terms of the supporting the hospital, we intend to support the hospital for a long time. We don't we don't make long, we don't make short term commitment. We go as we say we go we stay we we do house calls and we stay at partners in health and I think. Um, considering what the patients are benefiting right now, we don't want to stop that. And so we we'll continue to support the government and, and work with the government to continue to look for possible sources of funding to continue doing this program. Great, thank you, Byler. So to go back to Hannah, uh, to talk a little bit about patient-centered and person-centered care mm -hmm. and how you think about that as a leader and how you stay close to that mm -hmm. goal as a leader. Thanks, Maria. I think this is a really important question because I do think it's one of the areas where it's good to always challenge yourself to ask, you know, what more can we do? So I think we've been really fortunate to learn from engaging um, a patient and family advisory council in the work that we do. And that started with our work in our cancer program, understanding that cancer is very complicated and that it includes a lot of different partners, different health facilities, but then a lot of times for the individual themselves, it requires a lot of them at a time where they're in a really difficult position and where it may be really hard to be able to navigate all of those moving parts. And what we found in being able to engage that diverse group was that it, it was beyond just about, you know, what are the um, challenges related to cancer across the continuum, but was also about what are those ideas and solutions that can be implemented that can address it. And then even going deeper, if we're going to design a program, how should it be designed? How should it be implemented? How should we evaluate it? And I think being able to involve 
those individuals in that conversation speaking from the lived experience, it's not always typical that designing an evaluation for a program includes individuals that are actually affected by that program, where they can identify these are the things that are important to us that we feel it's important to understand if the program is addressing. And so I think as a leader, that has to be part of not only just the programs that we're doing, but all of the elements of the organization. So we also have, you know, kind of uh, an advisory board and that includes members from the community. And when we're thinking about, you know, a program that we're going to be expanding or piloting, having that feedback helps us to really understand what are the important resources we need to incorporate for that to be successful? Sometimes it can be, you know, easy to look at data and say, you know, this is a challenge or these numbers are high, but then that doesn't really tell us what's the best way to be able to leverage the strengths and fill the gaps to address it. And I think that also connects to the question that you asked about how are things sustained over time? I think they're sustained over time whenever they come from communities and it's something that they're really passionate about and they're bought into and then bringing in programs and then helping to fill those resources like Baylor was describing that's really important to make them possible and then thinking about you know sort of the downstream so if we recognize that the work of CHRs is really important in that process then making sure that we're connecting with them and getting their feedback not just once at a point in time but frequently because things change and then also, how do we strengthen that pipeline of individuals to become CHRs to fill some of those gaps? And how do we strengthen the opportunities to engage more patients, family members, to guide us in the work that we're doing? Thanks, Hannah. You know, you make such an important point about sustaining because, you know, we always think of sustainability as who's going to fill that resource gap. But I think bringing up you know, if we're addressing the community's needs and they are themselves engaged in the work, then it's uh, that also uh, is a way to sustain things. And I'm going to uh, sort of take a question from that and ask uh, Dr. Molino, um, because I know you still, as a clinician, do rounds very frequently. You uh, you are an expert ultra uh, ultra stenographer um, and a TB expert as well. So. How do you think about proximity building community and how does that relate to the, the stresses with the government? And you, you mentioned corruption. How do you mitigate that? How do you keep uh, the focus on the patient? Um, and uh, actually, you know, maybe I, I just see a note from, from Byler that he needs to leave. Uh, so Byler, uh, let me give you the last word um, before you uh, jump off and then we'll go to Molino. Go ahead, Byler, if you have time. Okay, if not, go ahead, Molino. Sorry, um, sorry, I was- Oh, go on ahead. Mute. I was go thinking ahead. I was on mute. Um, yeah, so thanks, thanks for organizing this panel. It's great and amazing. And I think um, one thing that I will have to say is that I mean, doing global health work means a lot of sacrifice and also a lot of understanding and listening. Because like for you, a good, a good leader is a leader that listens to the government and listens to what they want. And even if they're talking about the wrong thing, you can find a way to make sure that you put them in the right direction. And that's why from being part of the technical work, working groups in the ministries or whatever is where we can bring the change generally. So I want to thank everybody that attended and I'm sorry for leaving now because I have another important meeting right now. Thank you so much. <laughs> Challenges of leadership, right? <laughs> okay. So Molino, I'm wondering if you can, um, you know, share a little bit that sort of to, you know, the right to health really requires community engagement and government engagement. And um, as a sort of duty bearer, as an NGO, as a, as a somewhat neutral party, how do you deal with that? How do you stay proximate to patients? And how do you deal with the challenges of corruption or other challenges at the government level? That's like a question that we'll be talking about for the rest of our lives, but, <laughs> but give us your, uh, your thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Joya. Um, well, to respond to this question, I will 
um, just talk a little bit uh, for um, the when the first time I met uh, Paul um, 15 years ago. Um, so he came to my my country um, for the conference, and he asked me and other colleagues to um, do round uh, in a, in our hostels where where actually I was I was I was uh, I was trained, um, and um, you know, just thinking how he traveled from the U.S. All the way to Burundi, he gave a presentation and he asked to go and see patients. So uh, he taught me how important it is to be, you know, to always uh, be close to the patients. And I have seen this in you, Joya, uh, when he, when you traveled to all, to uh, to the sites to to Lesotho, you always go to see patients. So. And from the patients, we actually uh, not only provide healthcare, but we learn a lot from the patients. And we learn, you know, uh, on their suffering. Uh, we learn um, their needs, and we think how best can we find can we find solutions to their their their, their needs. And uh, we think of solutions. And we, we develop plans and we, we try to um, meet with the leaders um, from the community up to you know, the government officials to say, hey, this is what is needed. We are facing these needs. Our patients are, are, are having these problems. And this is what we think is better for, for them. So, and then comes um, the issue uh, of corruption. Because when you go and meet with uh, government officials and we present, you know, a uh, holistic approach um, to solve patients and community problems, sometimes they, they think that you have a lot of money. Um, they don't understand that, you know, when you have a good plan, you can try your best to raise, to raise money. They think you have money in the pocket. Then, um, yeah, the approach of corruption is, is complex, uh, but the best way is to really work closely with the leadership from the community to your know, Minister of Health and other government officials to really uh, keep trying to, uh, to push the agenda of uh, healthcare and make sure that you know money that is available we have limited resources definitely but we keep telling them that you know the small amount of money that we want we have we have to use it for the patient care um of course sometimes it is it is, it is not easy but uh that is our approach solving you know complex problems um mm -hmm. and dealing with uh, you know, requests from government officials, it's not always easy, um, but we have to, to stand on our feet and try to advocate for better health care of our, 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 our populations. Oops, Joya, you're on mute. Just to add that, um, that uh, you know, I think that there was a question about the specificity of uh, corruption. And I think what's, uh, what, what is interesting from my perspective of, um, you know, what Molino has had to face, um, he, you know, they're, they're it, particularly that some government officials want bribes, want money, want to dip into the pot of money that's being brought in for patient care. And so staying strong, on that is is you know very challenging can even be life threatening to believe you know believe it or not and um, so yeah so I think really important work uh, going on there uh, Hannah there's a question for you in the chat about sort of how do how did you get permission from local government authorities and I think you know thinking of the terrible history of the United States. 
um, against the indigenous people. I know that has been a sensitive and important um, topic for you. So maybe you can share um, some of that um, that struggle and, and how that works for COPE and for you personally as a non-Navajo person. Yeah, thank you, Joya. So I think this is an important question. And what I'll say is that when we started, I think what was really important was actually to start with those conversations, like understanding what would be helpful for, you know, at the time it was the CHR program, which is, you know, under Navajo Nation, what were the things that they felt would be meaningful and supportive, and also having that feedback from a few of the health facilities that were also collaborating, and being able to start small, so we didn't start, you know, spread across the whole area, actually we started with, you know, two um, geographic catchment areas and got that feedback and they were interested in trying to build you know a collaboration and they had you know very visionary leaders which I think was really important that you know wanted to find ways to support their programs and wanted to be able to fill some of the gaps because of the challenges in resources and what came out of that was that we listened and reflected what were the things that the program identified that would be helpful. So CHRs had mentioned it would be really important for us to have culturally tailored materials that we can share in the home with our patients that mm -hmm. are aligned with the information that they're receiving in the health facility and that it would be really helpful since they're based in the community to be better integrated with the health facilities. And so starting from that feedback gave us the opportunity to build those relationships. And it did take time. I think there's a lot of experience of programs that maybe start and they're a finite project. And once the project's completed, then you know those partners are no longer providing that support. And so certainly that had been an experience that CHRs and others had had in the past. And so in that early time frame, it was really important to be able to show that we were going to be there for the long term and also that we hadn't come in with our own ideas of this is what we think the solution is or this is what we think should be done. But really, we listened and understood what could be supportive. Mm -hmm. And I think that's always an evolving process. And as we were able to do that, and we could show that what we had said we were following through on over the years, we were able to build that trust and other areas were interested in us expanding our programs. And so I think it's really important to make sure that if, we start a commitment, we can actually follow through on it and that we're taking it at the pace that reflects, you know, what the community feels is appropriate and trying to really do the things that they've mentioned and showing that we're committed in the long term. I think that's been really important to build those partnerships. And then that's something that has to be maintained and invested in. And it is a process that takes time. But that really gave us the foundation to be able to go deeper. So because we had that trust with CHRs, we were able to understand how could we start to address challenges related to cancer care? How could we start to address challenges related to food access? And so being able to take those steps at the pace that made sense for our partners, but also following through and being there long-term, I think has been really important and making sure that we're getting that feedback, not just you know once a year, but actually as we're working on programs together, how are we challenging ourselves to know how can we do better? What are areas that we can strengthen? How can we expand you know, support? What are ways that we can get you know, feedback that reflects a lot of experiences? That's been really important. And sometimes that's the part that's like the hardest to think about because projects and deliverables can be straightforward, but really making sure that there's that investment 
in building those relationships, maintaining them and getting that feedback, particularly honest feedback, because that's really what's going to help us make sure that if we do need to make an adjustment or pivot, that we're getting that feedback in a way that allows us to be able to address it. So I think that's been really important and just, you know, the patience and that is something that we've seen um, really pay off over time. Thank you so much, Hannah, that, that was great. Um, you know, there are a few other questions um, in the chat. I, I haven't seen hands raised. I don't even know if that function is available. So um, I will continue with these. Um, you know, I somebody asked the question about cost. Um, and I want you to take that on, uh, Molino, because, you know, we certainly talk about equity as a very fundamental part of our program. Um, and equity, we know, you know, is health equity is very much un, has underpinning of economic inequity. Uh, so to achieve health equity, what what are the steps that you take to mitigate um, the cost to patients of care? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, as I said, um, the, the funding uh, in global health uh, is not enough. And one of my roles um, is to really support uh, resource mobilization. Um, we understand, you know, we need a lot of, um, a lot of money and we, we try to, you know, to prioritize. And we are, we've been, you know, uh, trying to hunt um, proposals, a call for proposals. <laughs> and um, we have to put together, you know, um, solid proposals to different donors. As I mentioned, like when we, we decided to, um, to equip our facilities with, uh, digital X-ray machines, portable digital X-ray machines. These are very fancy uh, machines. It's like a hundred thousand uh, US dollars um, each one. So you understand that, you know, to have these machines in each uh, health center, um, very remote, it's, it's not, many people will tell you that this is not sustainable. This is not possible, yeah. But um, there are donors, out there, um, which are willing to really support this movement of um, you know, social justice uh, in healthcare and bringing in uh, medical, innovative medical technologies to solve complex problems. Mm -hmm. That's how we ended up, you know, submitting proposal to uh, Japan government to grow a fund, um, and even now uh, because. Uh, different institutions have realized that, oh, it is possible. Like World Bank is now supporting uh, other facilities. So basically um, there are donors which, you know, are there uh, to help, but they don't know uh, what is possible. They, we, we, have, we, we have to be the ones, you know, guiding and showing the possibilities of solving the, the, the problems. So this is what we've been doing and I believe in global health, uh, this is what uh, we need to continue to do. And this is what Paul has taught us to do uh, when, you know, he thought of, you know, um, uh, having sites in far remote areas of, uh, you know, Haiti, Rwanda, uh, you know, Lesotho, Sierra Leone. This is, this is a movement. And this is what we have to do to really push this movement for, forward. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to um, have you add uh, to your response, Molino, and then I'm gonna give you each one last question so we finish on time. But uh, I want to, you to add, what do we do about individual patients' challenges in the cost of care, whether it's the out-of-pocket costs, the opportunity costs, how do you make sure that the poorest people actually get the services that they need? 
because we can build the systems as you're talking about, which is a very important part of the cost and the uh, what needs to be sustained. But what about at the patient level? Um, well, the patient level, um, what we we have done is really to try to um, to strengthen uh, primary healthcare uh, services and provide the services at the the lowest level of care uh, from community by involving um, you know village health workers or community health workers, and at the health center level, uh, making sure that we have enough um, you know staff, um, we have good space, we have um, uh, good systems, we have supplies. Um, and for patients whom we don't have a uh, capacity to, you know, to treat, we provide, um, you know, social support, including transportation, including uh, paying bills um, for the higher level. Um, in our context, we have patients that we have been, you know, referring to even to South Africa, uh, because some services are not available in the country, like, uh, you know, uh, oncology uh, services, um, like um, uh, some surgery. Um, so basically, we have to try our level best to uh, treat the patient. Not like this patient is not, um, we, don't have, we don't have resources to treat this patient. Remember, we are there to save lives. Mm -hmm. And a life is, doesn't have really um, a cost. We try by all means to address all needs of the patients. Thank you. So um, the last question um, I'll give both of you is a question from um, the, the, the chat, which is, um, can, you, can you share with us, um, what was the most meaningful impact of your training at Harvard and how has that impacted your leadership style or effectiveness? Hannah, you go first. Thanks, Joya. I think this is a great question and certainly one that I've thought about in the past. I think one of the things that was really exceptional about the program was that it was an opportunity to learn from your peers and that there was different types of conversations that you could have, you know, even with, for the different classes, you know, professors that were teaching. I think because the cohort had experience in different places, it kind of gave us a good foundation to have really deep and meaningful discussions. But then also, you know, after we might have covered something interesting in class, we would often be talking with each other about what does this mean and how can we actually learn from each other in different things that we've tried and implement that in our context. And I think that's pretty exceptional. Certainly it's something that I've reflected on that I've really appreciated over the years because and being able to have that sounding board as a leader, I think is something that's really important. You know, we're always learning. We're learning from individuals in the community. We're learning from our peers, our colleagues. And it's that opportunity that is so important. You know, certainly some of the technical skills are very, very valuable, but I find that knowing that there's someone who has experienced something and they're a resource and being able to have that as part of the program and the discussion was really meaningful to me. And I think it's something that makes the program very unique. And I think it does reflect, you know, the what had been shared earlier. I think the approach that Paul talked about a lot was like, you know, being present, you know, reflecting that experience, um, staying close to it. And I think the way the program structured enabled that to be possible as part of the program so that we were still working, you know, in our context and also learning from each other. Thanks, Hannah. Um, Dr. Molino, why don't you uh, take that? What what how what do you take from Harvard? How has that impacted your your views, your leadership style? 
Yeah, thank you, Julia. Um, well, I, I've learned a lot um, from uh, the program. And um, honestly, where the program, the way it is structured, um, you know, learning from case studies and also um, how, you know, um, we are thought of um, conducting research, um, not only quantitative, but also um, both qualitative and mixed method. Um, it has helped me to really um, think broadly how to address uh, a problem. And this is, to me, um, what, what is important um, uh, in global health. Uh, because what I have realized, I think, um, as Paul said, um, there is you know, a failure of imagination um, on how to solve uh, problems. And I think um, with the, the approach, the training program approach, um, and how you look at the problem and try to, to, to come up with um, solutions, um, and you, 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 you implement the solutions, and you learn from, you know, uh, when you evaluate that intervention, you learn from how, you know, you can even improve better. That is, to me, uh, the most important, I, the, the most important thing that I've, I've learned from, from the program. I'm sorry, you're on mute. Thanks, uh, Hannah. Thanks, Dr. Molino. Thank you to Dr. Barry, who had to run do his many leadership functions. Um, I want to thank so many people for uh, joining us for this important uh, seminar. There are some questions that are unanswered. And for some of you, uh, we would invite you to come to the information uh, session that we have on the program to learn more about the specifics of the program. Um, we have other panels coming up that we hope you'll join too with uh, uh, people who are working on logistics and supply chain and um, uh, environmental health, maternal health, uh, a variety of other things. And so um, the, next, the next panel will be on the 7th. So uh, I'll just turn it uh, over to Christina Lively. I wanna thank again our presenters and my colleagues and friends um, and all of you for joining us today. Christina. Yes, thanks, thanks so much, Joya. Also, I want to give a thanks to Bailey for being our host. And um, Bailey is also our admissions and outreach. Yes, uh, thank you, Bailey. <laughs> coordinator. So if you're interested in the program, Bailey is, will be hosting an information session on September 23rd. Um, as I was looking at the panelists, uh, sorry, the participants today, we had over 120 participants. I saw people, I saw students, alumni, faculty, and of course, many other people who we really look forward to meeting. So we just want to say a big thank you to everyone for joining us today. And again, our next panel will be October 7th. Um, if you are interested in learning more about that, I have put it in the chat, but I will also do that again. And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Mono.